Well, hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's virtual Thursdays at the Figgy series. My name is Melissa Moore. I'm Director of Education here at the Figgy. I'm very happy you could join us this evening. For the time being, we're hosting programs nearly every Thursday evening. Some of them are virtual like tonight, some of them are in person in small groups, and some of them are hybrid. So please make sure to check out the Figgy's website for topics and to register for those programs. We're able to offer these in no cost to you, thanks to the generous sponsorship of Chris and Mary Rayburn. Thank you so much, Chris and Mary. While these programs are free to watch, I encourage you to consider becoming a Figgy member. Your membership really helps us continue to fulfill our mission of bringing art and people together, even when we can't be together in person. So a quick note about tonight's program. If you have any questions uh, for our presenter, please enter them into the Q&A or the chat box at any time and we'll get to them as we can. It may be at the end of the presentation, but we'll keep an eye on them and, and get the responses to you when we can. All right, so with that, it is my pleasure to turn things over to Vanessa Sage, who is the Figgy's Assistant Curator of Fine Art and Design. Vanessa, thank you for joining us tonight and introducing the program. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Robin Holder. Uh, Holder is a socially engaged artist known for her multi-layered work addressing issues like cultural inequity, social justice, and the complexities of identity. Uh, she works in printmaking and mixed media, layering painting, drawing, digital images, and printmaking techniques to create her work. Uh, born in Chicago, Holder was raised in New York City, where she attended LaGuardia High School of Music and Art and the Art Students League. Uh, following time spent in Mexico and uh, time spent studying lithography in Amsterdam, she became the assistant director of Robert Blackburn's printmaking workshop until 1986. Since then, she has remained very active in arts education, including as a master teaching artist at the studio in a school, uh, training art teachers, at teaching residencies, and numerous other endeavors. Uh, her work is in numerous collections, including the David Driscoll Center and Yale University Art Gallery, and has been featured in many galleries and museums, most recently, actually currently, at uh, Art Rage Gallery in Syracuse, New York, uh, and recently at the LaGrange Art Museum in Georgia, the Kentler International Drawing Space in Brooklyn, and of course, alongside the work of Robert Blackburn and others in the exhibition at the Figgy, Robert Blackburn and Modern American Printmaking. Uh, so now I am pleased to turn things over to you, Robin. Uh, we very much appreciate you giving us this talk this evening, and I'm very excited to see all the images and hear what you have to say about your experiences with Robert Blackburn and the community of artists that he nurtured. Thank you so much, Vanessa, and thank you, Melissa. Um, I first want to thank the Figgy for presenting this exhibition because Bob, as many of us know, is one of the more unheralded artists who had a brilliantly extensive impact on generations of artists um, in the latter 20th century and early 21st century. Um, and I think um, there are probably three reasons why Bob never really was um, given the attention uh, as um, a printmaker, a printer, um, an educator and um, director and founder of a workshop. And I think that he deserves, and I think those three reasons are, first of all, he's an African-American man. Second of all, printmaking um, in the scheme of visual arts, perhaps until recently was always sort of the low media on the, on the totem pole with sculpture being the elite and then painting, people who did drawing and then later photography. So printmaking for many decades was really not taken uh, to be as serious as it, it really is. And that might be because in the American uh, contemporary mentality, any art making approach that involves tremendous craft is considered to be less invaluable. And I think the third reason is that Bob never had a consistent um, gallery or dealer 
to really manage his career. So thank you, Figgy, for um, presenting this exhibition. And I, of course, am honored to be a part of it. Um, I must say that um, I uh, first met Bob when I was about eight or nine years old. He was a friend of the family. So I had a familiarity with him um, that was very interesting. Bob had a number of nieces and nephews that he, in a way, almost helped raise. And um, he had a, made an agreement with them. And that was that if um, they would go to a gallery or a museum on Saturdays, he would also give them money to go to the movies. And sometimes I would go with them. And I'm actually still very close to one of his nieces, Melody Moore Williams, who's a very dear friend of mine. Um, I came to the workshop to actually work professionally in the, in the fall of 1977. Um, and so this photograph of a, a demonstration, open house was taken very shortly after I arrived. Um, and one thing I wanna really emphasize is that everybody who came to the workshop and almost anyone, because Bob, if Bob was in a restaurant, he would try to convince the people working in the restaurant to come to the workshop. If he was in the subway, he'd be talking to people, explaining why they should come to the workshop and do work. As a matter of fact, I, I did not see this happen, but I came in one day and I was told by a group of print makers that um, the workshop had not paid the federal taxes and that some uh, official representing the government had come to the workshop to escort Bob somewhere to answer some questions. And by the time they got to the bottom floor, because the workshop was on the sixth floor, he had convinced them to come back and try doing some printmaking demos. But the very um, unusual thing about Bob is that he understood and was really um, very attached to um, presenting and welcoming people to come to the workshop, to look at artists at work, to try their hand at something. And he really was adamant um, in the position that people approach printmaking in their own way. And there are some people who get along with groups. There are some people who are very individual and private. There are some people who have extensive technical um, expertise. There are some people that have really vital uh, visual imagery that they're creating but lack the technique. Um, there are people who uh, work well together, people who really have lots of challenges. In addition, I will mention, because this is something that people don't often talk about, but there is a very solid percentage of creative people who have mental imbalances. And I have seen through the years that Bob always welcomed everybody and put anything necessary in place to make those people feel comfortable and welcome. Um, printmaking is a really extraordinary media because there are so many techniques and continuously new techniques and combinations of approaches are being developed and experimented with. Um, in addition to the technology that uh, we generate as a creative society, there are always new ways to do things and combinations of old approaches and new procedures are always something that um, artists play around with. But the interesting thing about printmaking is that it um, brings together, aside from all of the issues that artists deal with in creating the plastic arts, which are um, themes, expressions, emotions, um, literature, music, um, personal experience, history, politics, um, any kind of endeavor that human beings are engaged in take a part in art making and specifically printmaking is utilizing all variety of chemical formulas, um, issues of, of physics and how different materials work or don't work together, um, optics, color theory. And when there are situations where 
a printer who is serving as a technical guide or advisor to a visual artist, there's a real um, delicate communicative uh, call and response activity happening. So all of these things were things that Bob thought about extensively. When I got to the workshop in the fall of 1977, after living abroad for five years, and uh, while I was working at the workshop administratively, it was on 17th Street in two different locations. But primarily the printmaking workshop was a 6,000 square foot space. And it was divided into um, four etching rooms, each with a floor press, um, one lithographic room with a lithography press, and then a very large general area that had two etching presses and another lithographic press. Um, and there was space for um, acid biting, um, grinding litho stones, although some people used lithographic plates. There was a plate cutter, storage racks, all kinds of lockers for people to keep their materials in, a room that had a flat file or many flat files with the workshop's collection, um, which grew and grew and grew because the uh, rule of thumb was for every edition that an artist or a publisher generated, uh, two prints would go into the printmaking workshop's collection. And people that were doing one of a kind pieces, monoprints, monotypes, um, would uh, donate one of every 10 prints. And so that really was uh, done on the honor system, but that's one of the ways, aside from the fact that people continuously gave Bob in the workshop gifts um, in the form of their own artwork, that's how the workshop developed its collection. There was a dark room area um, and a, a tiny little office, two uh, uh, restrooms and um, a little hallway. So the workshop made good use of its 6,000 square feet and it was enough space for people to be working and other people to be in another area chatting and not get in each other's way. Um, the workshop was never closed. It never closed. And I think when I was there, the official hours were probably 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. But many of the people, particularly people who worked at the workshop as monitors and uh, printers and administrative people would often print at night. So I, for example, would sometimes start at 7 p.m. and work straight through 12 hours till seven in the morning. Um, I remember some of the extraordinary relationships that um, artists who came in, sculptors, photographers, painters who came in and had additions uh, developed with the printers. And some of those printers were um, Devraj Dakoji, who's I believe still working at the workshop, Bill Hall, Julie DeMario, Kabuya Pamela Bowens, Lynn Rogan, Agnes Murray. And now that I'm saying the names of Kabuya, Lynn and Agnes and Kai January, I'm remembering that often the uh, master printers that worked in lithography, which by the way was Bob's favorite media or technique were women. And if anybody's familiar with stone lithography, you know that it takes a lot of physical um, stamina to deal with it. Kelly Driscoll was one of the really hardworking um, master printers. Um, some of the artists that I worked at with or met at the printmaking workshop are people that I'm still in touch with. For example, Von Sanchez. I, I remember Faith coming in to work on an edition. And I remember her going through her process of losing a tremendous amount of weight and then presenting her weight loss performance piece in, in a gallery. Betty Blayton Taylor, who was the one of the board members and also the founder and director of the Children's Art Carnival. As a matter of fact, um, when Bob did not have enough um, work for people, he would call Betty up and ask her if she needed any teaching artists. So a number of us would go back and forth between working in the printmaking workshop 
in some capacity and the Children's Art Carnival teaching with Betty. Uh, Romare Bearden, who was a, an advisor, um, Al Loving, who was one of the most generous artists, Marina Gutierrez, who, as a matter of fact, just opened a show last week at um, the Taller um, Latin Americano in Philadelphia, Bruce Waldman, who's one of the artists who's still working at the workshop, Michael Kelly Williams, Elger Cortor, Camille Billups, was very close to Bob. And actually Camille um, was one of my mentors and um, she was a sculptor and a printmaker and she did films and she and her husband, Jim Hatch, um, founded and led the Hatchville Archives, which is an extraordinary collection of um, in-person artist interviews and talks um, that she spearheaded over a period of, I believe it was 30 years. And that collection of artist interviews um, is now housed at Emory, I believe. And um, Curly Holton, who has been a monumentally supportive person of Bob and the printmaking workshop, Vivian Brown, Emma Amos, Whitfield Lavelle, Nancy Wells, and so on. There are, um, hundreds and hundreds of more people that I just can't name now. But the point I think I'm trying to make is that there are, were so many people that came through the workshop or who worked regularly in the workshop or who would associate it with the workshop that anybody connected to the workshop kind of belongs to an extended family. And here's an example. Um, of an exhibition that Ken Kelleba House Gallery, which was founded um, by Joe Overstreet and his wife, Corinne Jennings, and it's still um, functioning and vibrant, um, hosted an exhibition of Elizabeth Catlett's work um, with two younger artists, and that was myself and um, another artist named John. And so here is um, the opening of the exhibition. And, I'm over here at the far left and Emma Amos, Bob, Pancho and Elizabeth. So um, this is just one of thousands of interactions and support um, systems that were in, intact. Um, here's an, another photograph of one of my personal shows early in 1984. And we have Herb Gentry, um, uh, unfortunately deceased, Vincent Smith deceased, um, Ed Clark, deceased, and Greg L Russell, who's still with us, who I actually saw a couple of months ago. But there were always these um, interconnected um, pathways. So people who worked at the shop or who were familiar at, with the shop would find out about various um, creative uh, events, receptions for the openings of shows, um, artist lectures, artist talks, people would come to the workshop and somebody might say, listen, I'm leaving, I'm going to, um, so uh, uh, I'm going to Charlotte Richardson's, you wanna come with me, they'd go. And this is how the, the extended network grew and grew and grew. Here's um, an, an interesting um, example of one of the kinds of technical sharing that happened um, Betty Blayton Taylor, as I mentioned, who um, founded and directed and led the Children's Art Carnival, received a big box of um, these semi-transparent, thin um, plastics. And actually, they ended up being the scrims that are used to color the lights in the theater. And there were many sheets of this material. And playing around with this material, Michael Kelly Williams realized that it could resist the lithotine and the oils that are used often to clean oil-based inks off of surfaces. In addition, they were thin enough to cut with a pair of scissors or an X-Acto knife and um, lay absolutely flat. So you could put them on top of a piece of plexiglass on top of a piece of zinc or copper. Um, and actually Michael Kelly Williams and I experimented um, with cutting up shapes out of this material. 
And I, here I have two examples of prints that I made where every shape that you see here actually is an inked plastic stencil. Betty at one point got very involved in using this plastic material also, and it shows up in a lot of her prints. Um, so it, it's a wonderful um, example of artists finding some stuff that we didn't really know what it was and playing around with and finding that it was very useful. Um, and here I'm showing my particular approach to printmaking at the time, which was I would have a matrix or a composition that was the same from print to print, but I would ink um, the different stencils that I created differently. So each print was slightly different. Um, we would always have people coming into the printmaking workshop who wanted to look at artists at work or who were visiting uh, publishers or artists whose works were being editioned. Um, art historians would come from colleges and universities to look at the printmaking workshops collection. Um, curators would come to curate shows to see a panorama of various artists' work. Um, I remember very clearly at one point we had this wonderful Puerto Rican artist named um, Carlos Sueños, who was in charge of the collection, which consisted of a small room filled literally from the floor almost to the ceiling of very large flat files. So there was always activity in one form or another at the printmaking workshop. Um, here's another example of an opening. This is an opening of an, actually of another ex exhibition of mine. And um, here's Bob, here's myself, here's Betty Blayton in the background. This looks like it could be Olivia Beans, Vincent Fitzgerald, and here at the edge, Marjorie Hunt Van Dyke, who was the master printer who printed all of Vincent's uh, published jobs. So um, there was this never ending, exciting uh, interfacing of activity. Um, when you went into the workshop, you never really knew what would happen. As a matter of fact, one day, I was sitting in the office and the L as if I could hear the elevator open because it was very close to the office. And I heard somebody's voice that sounded a little familiar. And I looked, poked my head out the window and in walks Jacques Van Alphen, an artist that I had met in Amsterdam at the lithographic shop that I was working in. And I had no idea that he was in New York. He had no idea that I was at the printmaking workshop. But then again, this sort of interconnectedness uh, was always in play at the workshop. Um, here's a picture of Bob and myself looking at somebody's work and I can't recognize who it, who it is. Um, but one thing I thought was kind of unique about Bob is that he focused very much on the technical aspects of people's work. He never, said anything about the theme of the imagery. I never, at least I never heard him comment on uh, the actual image. Uh, I remember one day I was printing or one evening actually I was printing, it was late and he and Elizabeth Catlett came in to the printing room I was working in and I had just lifted a print off my plate and I had laid it down to, to rest for a few minutes and they both came in and they both wear, wore thick glasses. And I just saw them bend over and take their glasses off and look very closely at my print and then look up and look down at my print in a very studied way for a few minutes. And then they both turned to me and they said, well, how did you get that effect? How did you achieve that? And I felt like I had just received a PhD in printmaking because I figured like if these two brilliant artists and Bob particularly as a master printer who knew so many different techniques were wondering how I had achieved something I must have done something engaging and, and interesting. Um, the other thing that I wanna mention about the printmaking workshop that I thought was very, very special is that what we have to keep in mind that art, when artists are working um, in order for their work to flow, in order to actually create, they have to 
render themselves in a state of vulnerability. Um, and somehow most of the people who worked in the workshop were able to do that, although they were surrounded by others in the space. And I thought that was really very, very particularly special. Um, I would watch people come to the workshop for the first time. As a matter of fact, I remember the first day Deborah Cohen worked, walked into the workshop and really enjoyed watching her glow, grow and flourish and extend and expand herself professionally. Um, but Bob was able to sort of capture uh, the sensibility of a person and guide them or suggest things for them that were appropriate for them. And I thought that that was a very, very important quality for a, a, a mentor to have. The workshop um, provided um, a communal workspace, private editioning rooms, um, classes, guest artists, projects, scholarships, exhibitions, and a community outreach program. Now, when I first arrived at the workshop, Bob asked me if I wanted to train as a master printer, and I didn't think that, that I had the temperament for that because I figured the way that he explained it to me, um, you would gain experience in a number of different printmaking techniques, and then you would help an artist realize their vision. And I thought, well, I don't have the ego for that. I wouldn't be able to suspend my own opinion and perspective in order to facilitate somebody else's vision. So I told them I thought I, I was very organized. I was very meticulous. I could see the, the big picture and the small picture at the same time, very sequential, very honest. And I thought I would make a good administrator. And he took a chance on me. And he gave me a job as the community outreach program coordinator. And that quickly grew into being the assistant director. So I was the person for the years that I was there who wrote all of the grant proposals, um, interfaced with all of the funding sources, wrote the um, annual reports, took most of the photographs, organized the um, strategies of the editioning rooms, um, suggested people who could be given scholarship, organized some of the exhibitions and scheduled the classes and had um, a relationship with all of the people who are teaching classes and teaching in our community program. The printmaking workshop had, I can't remember if it was six or eight small tabletop uh, presses. Most of them were little MarTech presses and we would use those to go into schools and community centers and cultural centers to um, teach printmaking to children using water-based inks. And this also provided um, some income for, for, for some of the artists. Um, I saw many people meet and fall in love with the workshop, meet and become partners, um, curators meeting artists, collectors meeting artists, artists meeting um, people that referred them to, to jobs, to um, master programs, and so on and so forth. So this extraordinary exchange of continuous flowing information was something that everybody really um, lived with and, and had an advantage with. This is a picture of a very personal incident that happened. I had been printing this particular print um, or series of works after taking a trip to Egypt and I was trying to express this feeling of being um, in a place that was ancient or, or um, had a, a history of 3000 years and being aware of how it existed in our real time in the 20th century. And I had been thinking of space and time and how there's a continuum. And I took a break from working and I went into the office just to sit down and get out of the room, get away from the um, lithographic ink smell. And I saw Bob, he was putting the phone down and he just had this little tear running down his face. And he just said that Mel Edwards had called him to tell him that Romare Bearden had died. And um, that was one of those really powerful, viscerally um, uh, impactful moments that I experienced at the printmaking workshop. So when I finished the image, 
I called it Horus of the, of the um, New Age. Um, the printmaking workshop had many partners and uh, other organizations and institutions that it, it interacted with. And some of them were the Brandywine Workshop with Alan Edmonds at the helm in Philadelphia, Sankey Gallery, which was founded by Norman Lewis, Romeo Burden, and Ernest Critchlow. Um, the Lower East Side Print Shop actually, which was originally like a community program of the printmaking workshop pioneered by Eleanor Majid, um, just above Midtown, a gallery, Tayer Bordiqua, the art students leaves. As a matter of fact, there were a number of um, artists who were on student visas who came through the Art Students League and did not want to leave um, New York when their visas and uh, permission to stay through the league were up. So the, the Art Students League would call Bob and Bob would often try to find some way to keep them um, in New York and, and work um, at the printmaking workshop or through the printmaking workshop. And I remember one instance in particular, there was a young Chinese um, artist and she was in tears. She was just um, hysterically uh, upset. And she was saying, if I go back, they're gonna make me get married. And Bob found a way to, to keep her in New York. And to, he even spoke, I think with her father and assured her father that she would be safe, that she would be, gay and be engaged in something professional. Um, this photograph here is um, one of the days that um, Bob was invited uh, to the Parsons School of Design and Altus de Chavon um, connection to go to uh, La Romana, to the Altus de Chavon um, uh, workshop, which was in the midst of this extremely elegant international tourist spot um, where they had an art school. And Bob took me and Kelly Driscoll with him and we were to stay a week and work from like 10 a.m. to 4.30. But actually what happened was we were working with a group of eight Dominican artists and teaching printmaking because they were painters and sculptors. But we ended up working from 9 a.m. to midnight every day around the clock. We just couldn't stop working. And those were the kinds of things that would happen. So here I'm having on the slide a list of some of the places that the workshop would interface with regularly. Um, Columbia University, because of course Bob taught there, um, Museo del Barrio, Rutgers Printmaking Department, um, Emma Amos was a professor at Rutgers and Camille Billups for a while also. Um, and of course, Bob knew all of the different people in the printmaking departments and universities and, co and um, colleges across the country. And here's a picture um, of one of the workshop uh, open houses and this wonderful Indian artist, Bal Baswant. Um, and Bob really did whatever he could to um, promote a sort of interracial, interethnic, international um, exchange of people. And there was this wonderful connection with Muhammad Malehi, who had come from a small village in Morocco called Asila. And he, along with Muhammad Khalil, a Sudanese printmaker who was based in New York, um, would invite artists um, in the summer to go to this sort of like an artist colony in the small town of Asila. Um, and I understand that Asila is, um, became a cultural center in Morocco. Um, this is a, a, day, a day that, um, uh, this is a day that I really suffered because the um, New York Foundation for the Arts asked me to be the focal point of a cultural commercial that they wanted to run on PBS. And so they asked me if they could film me doing a print. And I, of course, agreed, not knowing that to get uh, like 45 seconds, it would take 12 hours. And they were blowing smoke all around the place and it had this acrid smell. And I was trying to concentrate on my work. But here is etching room four. Um, one day, a few of us got together uh, and we just tried to make a list of all of the printmaking workshops that had been offshoots of the printmaking workshop, of Bob's printmaking workshop. 
Now, when I say printmaking workshops, I don't mean a person who, like myself, who privately has a press in their in their studio and does printmaking. I mean printmaking workshops that hosted printers that had other people come in and work. And at the time that we did this, which must have been in the late 1980s, there were about 60 printmaking workshops that we could list. Um, I don't know what happened to that tree that we made, but some of the ones are Kathy Caraccio's, which incidentally is like literally next door to the current uh, version of Bob's workshop. Van Deb Editions, Bill um, Hall's Nile Press, the Lower East Side Print Shop, which as I mentioned had been started by Eleanor Magid as a printmaking workshop community program. Kelly Driscoll, Muhammad Khalil, and of course, one of the more extensive workshops was Curly Holton's Experimental Printmaking Institute that he developed at Lafayette College, Lafayette College which has had a brilliant life of um, serving to teach students and connect students with printers and printmakers and artists and publish scores and scores of editions. And, Curly was always a, a wonderful and very activated supporter of, of Bob's. Um, this is a picture of a, a panel discussion that uh, we did in, uh, 19, in, in 2015 that was um, uh, done in, in collaboration with uh, the Ken Kellibas Wilmer Jennings Gallery. Now, this happened as um, an addition to the exhibition that um, the David Driscoll Center organized of Bob Blackburn's work. And I believe it was the first one person retrospective of Bob's work and it was entitled Passages. So when the exhibition traveled to New York City, Corrine Jennings uh, agreed to host it. And we had this wonderful, um, panel discussion um, over on this side was Camille and Eleanor Majid, but they uh, Eleanor's face got chopped off and Camille arrived a little late. But all of these people, Wes Cochran, a collector who has a, um, a, an exhibiting space in LaGrange, Georgia himself, Agnes Murray, a brilliant um, master lithographer and artist herself, my, me, Bill Hall, Betty Blayton Taylor and Dr. Deborah Cohen. Um, here's a picture of my studio, um, just to give a little sense of some of the space. And then here, this is uh, the room that I'm in currently, but this is a different view of it on my etching press um, and the work that I'm currently doing, which is very large. Um, another area of my studio, and here I have a little print that Elizabeth Catlett gave me. And um, this is just uh, giving a sense of the work that I'm doing now, which is much larger than I could do myself on an etching press. So the approach that I use with this is I take small prints that I've made that have textures and patterns on them and colored pencil portraits, and I digitally collage them and then I have them printed up large by a, a wonderful guy that I work with, Rayo Graphics. Um, and then I paint and draw on top of them. So I think that that's it. Um, I think I've been able to give a kind of a, a panoramic view of the, of the time that I worked at the workshop. I, I was the assistant director from 19... 77, end of 1977 to 1986. And then I stayed uh, for several years doing uh, my own work at the workshop until I bought my own etching press. But that kind of gives an idea, I hope, of how special Bob was and how special Bob's printmaking workshop was and the kinds of impact. I know that, that for um, example, the artists that I mentioned before, um, Agnes Murray, who is a painter and a printmaker and a really powerful um, printmaking instructor, told me not 
too long ago, a couple of years ago, she said, not a day goes by that I don't think of Bob Blackburn. And every time I get together with um, people that I met at the shop or that I knew through the shop, they mention very specific um, instances that they remember of how Bob influenced them, how Bob gave them a referral to get a teaching position or how, I remember Anna Golici, who's a really brilliant Romanian artist and printmaker, um, told me that when she first arrived at New York, somehow she made her way to the printmaking workshop. And at one point she told Bob that she was looking for a job and Bob said, okay, this is what you do. You go to the boss, the supervisor, whoever's hiring you, um, you offer to work for free for three days and you do everything you possibly can to make yourself familiar with the position and of course do your very best job and then see how it goes. And of course she got the position. I don't remember what the position was, but Bob had advice for everybody. And not only that, the advice that he offered always seemed to be very specifically appropriate for the sensibilities of the person who was receiving his, his, his guidance. So I thought he had some kind of a very special um, ability to capture um, the skills, sensibilities, and characteristics of people individually. So Vanessa, Melissa, I'm uh, open for whatever questions or comments that anybody might have or any kind of in-depth um, explanations of something that they found interesting or engaging. Oh, well, thank you, Robin. That was wonderful. Uh, we've got some great feedback already um, talking about how um, your presentation really made clear how exceptional of a person Bob was, Bob Blackburn was. And that's from Andrew Wallace, who's our director of collections and exhibitions. So thank you. Yeah, there was this, I think most people that worked at the shop or who came to visit the shop always had this feeling that something um, unexpected that would happen, and usually something that would lead to something that would extend your understanding or extend your possibilities or extend your opportunities. There was this magical um, constant interaction between people and you never knew who would be there really. So there was this tingly kind of a feeling, I think, that people would always have when they entered the shop. And actually, it got to a point where, it, for me, I had to get some work done. So there were times when I would just like stay home to work, which that did not that people didn't do that back then. Um, and my assistant Leslie DeGurda Myers, we would just stay in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and work because it would just get so exciting at the workshop that it, you, you couldn't maintain your focus. Uh, so we do have a question as, can you speak to Bob's relationship with uh, Tatiana Grossman and the importance oh, of- Oh, to Tatiana. Um, yeah, I know that they had a very close relationship, but unfortunately I can't give any details or behind the scenes anecdotes about it. Um, and I don't remember if I actually ever met her or not. Um, that was one of the um, sacrifices I had to make because I kind of had to keep my eye on the what I had to do because I worked uh, part time and I was raising a son and I had to do my own work. So yes, um, whoever asked that, he did have a very special extensive relationship with Tatania, but I can't offer any um, anecdotal information, unfortunately. And then uh, another question was, can you tell us a little bit about the workshop now? How, um, how do you find it since it's... Um, I, I haven't really gone there um, since about five or six years ago. Um, I don't have that much time to come into the city since I have my own equipment, my own space. Um, I don't have reason to go there. Um, 
I do know that they have active classes, um, that it is uh, a diverse group of artists that are working there. I do know that Bruce Waldman, who is a very dear friend of mine who started working at the print shop around the same year I did, 1977, 78, is still working there. But I can't really offer too much about it other than what I, I just read on their bulletins. There's one thing I will say, Bob never really took to silkscreen. He never really had any silkscreen setups. Um, he never uh, really had too much. I, I really, he, he just really did not, was not a fan of silkscreening. And I know that the Manhattan Graphic Center and the Lower East Side Print Shop really embraced silkscreening and offered space and equipment and supplies for doing that. I do know that the current printmaking workshop has um, uh, uh, computers for digital imaging. imaging. They have, I think they're doing, uh, I think uh, Anna Golici is teaching foil stamp printing, which is something that I learned from her. I think they also give um, classes in Adobe Photoshop as well as all the other conventional printmaking media. So they are a little bit extended. The space is a bit smaller. So, um, you know, it, and it's a different world now. So um, I can't really say much more than that. Just a reminder. Oh. Yeah. I was gonna remind our audience members that they can put their questions into the Q&A or chat, or if they have questions that come in after the program, you can respond to the link email that was sent to you and we'll get those to Robin. But I'm sorry to interrupt. Something, that's okay. There's something that also I think is very important about Bob and the Printmaking Workshop for um, people who are interested just in how arts organizations survive and thrive. And that is that um, there were, um, several attempts through the years that I was very close to Bob's shop where people tried to encourage Bob to get a more conventional board of directors and to structure itself where there would be a division between a creative director and an administrative director. And I remember in the late seventies and the early eighties, a lot of nonprofit organizations were making that decision whether they would really strike out and um, create strategies that would actually make them uh, institutions, in which case they ha would be much, have a much longer life. And I remember Bob and I having many conversations about that, and he would point out what happened with Alvin Ailey, point out what happened with the Negro Ensemble Company, and um, he always decided that he did not want to do what was necessary to make the workshop um, uh, an institution or to make the board more um, uh, conventional, which probably would have created more of an income stream for the workshop. But on the other hand, I think a lot of the magical spontaneity would have been lost because a lot of things that happened at the workshop happened really against whatever annual plan I put together. So as a matter of fact, what I had to do was, um, and I, I told a couple of people, I told Betty and I think I might've told Camille about it privately because I thought this is something that I don't wanna get caught up in legally. There were two checking accounts and I had power of signature over one of them. And so what I would do, it, it, it would, the checks were like checks and it had like a stubs for each check, a little stub. So on the back of the stub, I put in pencil really small and very light, the actual amount. But on the front of the stub, I put an amount that was like three or five or $7,000 less. So that if Bob picked up the checkbook, he would see that there was less money and he wouldn't go out and, and come back with two new guest artists that we had to pay for. So um, there, there was always economic strife, always economic strife. And one of the advantages for those of us who worked there was 
when you work at a small, really creative, um, engaging uh, arts organization that um, can't afford to have the right number of people for all the jobs, you end up learning a lot. So I really got the advantage of learning how to write grants, how to talk to funders, um, how to ask difficult questions about programming, how to um, you know, fight for the right to do something in front of, of funding sources, um, because you're always in the middle of three years, you're writing your report for the previous year, you're administrating and documenting your current year, and you're you know, brainstorming and envisioning how you'll write the uh, proposals for the next year. So it's this endless continuum, but I really got a tremendous amount of um, skill building through having that um, position. And a lot of the funding sources would just, I think they, everybody knew Bob and they knew how um, unorthodox he was in doing his programming and they knew how important the workshops programming he was so that they would really um, embrace me and give me a lot of extra advice. It's, you know, it's so interesting the way that you framed all that. Thank you, Robin, for sharing with us tonight. These are, um, these are photographs and experiences that we otherwise wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to experience. So thank you for that. And I know our, our participants welcome. feel the same way. Um, we've had a couple more come in privately just to say thank you. So I really appreciate that. Um, Vanessa, also thank you for your help on this, as well as for your curatorial work on making sure that the exhibition looks as wonderful as it does in the space that we have here. Just as a reminder, you can view that, is it through January 9th? Is that when the exhibition? Yep. Yeah. So come to, if you're in town, please remember to come down and see the exhibition through January 9th. We do have a mask mandate in place, but we have masks just in case you forget yours. So please don't let that stop you. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you at other programs, either in person or virtually. One more time though, Robin, just thank you for, for being welcome. with us tonight. And thank you. Yeah, this was delightful um, and just a I'm wonderful glad. insight. Yeah. Okay. All right. And we'll have a okay. wonderful evening, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye. Okay.